Thank you all so much for joining us. We're so excited to have Dr. Peter Gentry on our virtual Q&A today. We hope that this conversation about the profits is going to be encouraging to you guys and we'll give you a glimpse of the type of stuff you learn in class with him. So Dr. Gentry is our uh, distinguished visiting professor of Old Testament and he is um, also a senior research fellow with our Text and Canon Institute. So we are very grateful to have him on our faculty, and we um, are really excited to hear about his expertise in the prophets, and that's why this call is happening today. He's written a book called How to Read and Understand the Biblical Prophets. So Dr. Gentry, would you explain just a little bit about um, your experience in theological higher education and how you ended up at Phoenix Seminary, and then we will jump into um, talking through the prophets. Well, I began with, uh, in my late teenage years, with a call into Christian ministry. And that uh, focused, that began to focus particularly on discipling and equipping and preparing and training others for ministry, uh, Christian ministry. And uh, I, I've, I've been doing this for about 40 years. I, I spent about 15 years in Toronto, Ontario, Canada, teaching at uh, Toronto Baptist Seminary and Bible College. And then, uh, then we moved to Louisville, Kentucky, and I was teaching at uh, the Southern Baptist Theological Seminary. I was interested in serving there because they had a doctoral program, and I wanted an opportunity not only to train uh, men and women for Christian ministry, but I wanted to train the people that train the people. So uh, when you uh, are involved in a doctoral program, you're e discipling, equipping, mentoring, and training those who will uh, be te training others. So you're teaching the teachers. And uh, in uh, last year, I, I retired from my uh, full-time teaching and... Um, and was asked to do some part-time uh, work at Phoenix Seminary. So I'm, I'm there on campus from January 1 to April 30, uh, teaching a couple of classes and interacting with the students and working on the Text and Canon Institute. And uh, uh, I'm, I guess that contact came about because two of my students are professors at uh, Phoenix, uh, Dr. John Mead and Dr. Brian Arnold. Yeah, we, um, we love those two men very dearly here at the seminary and your influence on their education and their um, formation as leaders and as um, teachers and pastors is really evident and um, it's been such a blessing, not only to sit in your class and learn directly from you, but also to sit in their class and learn from them and be able to see your influence on them. So thank you for that work. Um, thank you for sharing a little bit of your history. And now, if you don't mind, we'll go ahead and jumpstart our conversation on the prophets. Sure. Um, if you guys have questions that come up as we're going, please feel free to throw them in the chat. We'll add them to our list of questions to ask. So, Dr. Gentry, why don't we just start out with what is biblical prophecy? Well, uh, I guess this is an advertisement for the book, How to Read <laughs> and Understand the Biblical Prophets. And you can see how skinny this book is. It's only, uh, it's only 130 pages. <clears throat> A lot of people think about biblical prophecy as... Uh, grand schemes for the future and so they uh, they want to expound the prophetic books to try and uh, de de describe to people what will what will happen in the future but that that is not primarily what the prophets are about the pro the the uh, the the focus first and foremost in the prophetic books and uh, here we're thinking of uh, the, the major prophets, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel. Uh, there are 
There's the book of the 12 minor prophets. And then we can also consider uh, a book like Daniel among the prophets. So the, the, uh, the focus first and foremost is to bring back, bring the people back to the covenant relationship. So uh, when, when, uh, well, if you if you go back to the beginning of Israel, God made a covenant with Abraham, and uh, that's described in Genesis chapter twelve, chapter fifteen, chapter seventeen, chapter twenty-two. And then when uh, when Abraham's descendants became a nation, God brought them out of Egypt. They were in slavery in Egypt for four hundred years. God brought them out of Egypt, brought them to Canaan. Uh, and gave them the land of Canaan. But on the way, they stopped at Mount Sinai, and there God made a covenant with his people. Uh, God made a covenant with his people, Israel. And uh, we can sort of view this as a marriage relationship. God, God or Yahweh, as he made himself, he gave his personal name to his people, entered into a marriage relationship with Israel. And to make a long story short, what the books of Joshua, Judges, Samuel, Kings show is that the people were not faith, faithful in the in the marriage relationship. Uh, a marriage is a, mar a covenant. Marriage is a covenant. It's an agreement. It's an. I define uh, a covenant as an agreement between two parties, making binding, official, and permanent a relationship of loyalty, love, and trust. And uh, like many marriages, uh, the, the relationship between God and Israel broke down, not because of God, any shortcomings on the part of God, but because of shortcomings on the part of the people. They, they failed in their love, their loyalty, their trust, and in their obedience. And so the... When we get to uh, there were there were two kinds of prophets. There were writing, there were non-writing prophets, and there were writing prophets. So people like Samuel, Samuel uh, were these people, and and Elijah and Elisha. These people were calling Israel back to the covenant relationship, but they didn't write anything down. What happened is that there came a point. There came a point in the in the relationship where the where the marriage was totally broken, and if we go back to Deuteronomy, when God made the covenant with Israel, there were blessings for obedience, and there were curses for disobedience, and uh, God eventually had to carry out the curses. I don't know if you've ever been to a grocery store and seeing a, a mother with a bratty child. And you hear the mother say to the child for the 10th time, if you do that again, I'll whatever. And then you find, you think to yourself, when is this mother going to come across and fulfill her threats? Well, God finally has to fulfill uh, his, his, uh, the curses. And that means that he is going to judge Israel and he's going to use the Assyrians and Babylonians to bring judgment upon Israel. But that's not the end of the story. Deuteronomy 32, the Song of Moses, shows that even though Israel is unfaithful and God will judge her, in the end, God will restore Israel for because of his own character, because of his own faithfulness and loyalty to himself and to his promises. So... Judgment is not the end of the story. Uh, God will restore his people. And uh, that's why there are predict. That's one of the reasons why there are predictions concerning the future in the prophets, because they're telling them, look, the Assyrians are coming. The Babylonians are coming. God is going to bring destruction, destruction and judgment. But that's not the end of the story. God is going to bring deliverance and salvation, particularly through a coming king, a coming deliverer, uh, who is described in various ways. And uh, all of the promises that are related to that coming deliverer 
are mentioned in various ways all throughout the prophetic books. So there is, there is a there is an aspect in which the prophetic books deal with the future, but that's not the main point. The main point is to renew and restore the covenant, the broken covenant relationship. Well, that is incredibly helpful in understanding um, who the prophets were, what their mission was, what their message was, and um, kind of how to go about reading them. Um, so that's really helpful context. Um, would you mind answering one more of my questions before we jump in with um, some of the some of the other questions? Sure. What are some distinct characteristics of the prophecy genre? So we're talking more literary now instead of um, their message. Yes. Well, that's a very important question. When we look at a when we look at um, a newspaper, um, many of you young people don't even know what a newspaper is, but uh, if you can remember what a newspaper is, uh, it contains many different kinds of literature. So there's the, there's the news on the front page, and then we have uh, a section dealing with business. We have a section dealing with real estate. We have a section dealing with travel. We have uh, theater and entertainment. We have book reviews. We have uh, political editorials and cartoons. We have comics. We have stocks and bonds. We have classified ads. And we have, um, and we have uh, obituaries. Some people, uh, some people only want to read the obituaries. But uh, the first thing is to realize is that the, 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 the books that were written by the prophets actually contained every, contain, it doesn't represent one kind of literature. It represents many different kinds of literature. So when we read the prophetic books, there are prose statements. There is poetry. There are proverbs, there are dramas, uh, dramatic actions. For example, uh, for example, Ezekiel uh, get, um, draws a diagram of the siege of Jerusalem on a brick. And then he has a frying pan that he's holding between himself and the brick to show them that, the prayer, that when the Babylonians besiege the city, their prayers will not get through to God. So we have dramatic, dramatic actions. We have plays, if you want, one-act one plays, one-act dramas. We have allegories. We have parables. We have uh, so, uh, and and we have um, even apocalyptic literature, where um, where uh, which, which I discuss in the book, and I show that uh, apocalyptic language comes from the doctrine of creation. Uh, the, the most important doctrine in Israel was the doctrine of creation, that God made the world. And when things go wrong, it's kind of like an, uncre an, an uncreation. The whole world is coming apart. Uh, and uh, so they use language like uh, the sun, the sun will, will go dark and the moon will fall out of the sky. Not because there's, they're not describing what's literally going to happen, but they're basically saying my world has come to an end. So, the, there are, uh, every every communication trick in the book is used by the prophets, and uh, some of it's even R-rated literature. Uh, Isaiah goes naked and barefoot for three years, and uh, Jeremiah hides his underwear in a rock. So it's. It's sort of like uh, some of the passages are, are we might say, R-rated. That's awesome. That's so helpful. Um, thank you so much, Dr. Gentry. Well, without further ado, uh, we're going to jump into some of your guys' questions. So I'm going to have Chris, uh, you submitted a question via email. If you would like to unmute yourself and ask Dr. Gentry that question, you can do so now. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Gentry, uh, for being with us. Um, it's actually a double question, mainly about the uh, revelation of John. Um, through the COVID crisis, we had 
especially one guy in our church who said that now on the last days Jesus is coming and he was in interpreting the, the revelation and, and seeing the signs today. So for me, the question is, um, it could, I think it could be that Jesus is coming within the next years, but um, most likely, I guess he's not. Um, how to respond to this kind of interpretation and um, how to interpret, um, especially John, um, for our days today? Yes. Well, that's a very big question. But uh, I spoke on, uh, I gave a message on Revelation chapter 13, uh, uh, at the at the convocation for Toronto Baptist Seminary in September of last year, and it it's on YouTube somewhere. I don't know if I can find the. Uh, I'm not skilled enough to find the link while we're talking, but um, the question is: there are different approaches to the Book of Revelation, and I'm just going to go over them. Some people think that everything in the book of Revelation has already happened. Some people think that it's only describing things in the distant future. And, uh, uh, but I think, uh, I think what we need to realize, I think we need to take a literary approach to the book of Revelation and realize that John, uh, John is communicating uh, with his audience the way people communicate in editorial cartoons. So uh, uh, I don't know the man who who asked this question. Uh, what was his name? Chris. C Chris, are you in the United States? Um, no, I'm in Austria, in Europe. Oh, okay. Well, uh, in the United States, when when uh, you know uh, there after the front page of the newspaper, there's a section with editorial comment, and and. They also have political cartoons, and these cartoons are standardized. So, for example, in the United States, they have, what is it, uh, 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 an elephant and a donkey. So, um, one, the, I don't remember, does anyone remember which party is represented by the donkey and which party is represented by the uh, elephant? Well, I don't remember the the Republicans or the Dem I'm from Canada, so I never get this straight. But uh, one of the parties is represented by a donkey, and one of the parties is represented by an elephant. And so when you see the cartoon, everybody automatically knows what they're talking about. And it's the way these animals are pictured and the things that people are doing to them or they're doing to people that shapes your perspective on the political situation. Do you understand what I'm saying? And so when, when, for example, in Revelation 13, when he talks about a beast coming up out of the sea and another beast coming up out of the earth, uh, he, he's using the book of, uh, the background for these images come from the book of Daniel, but he's picturing, he's picturing the Roman Empire uh, as an animal. Uh, and it's like an, it's like a, I would say it's more like a, a cartoon in an editorial that is shaping the perspective, is shaping the perspective of his readers. So, for example, uh, while everybody, while while the Ro while the emperors wanted you to think that the Roman Empire is great and bringing peace to everybody and bringing salvation to everybody. Uh, uh, John, John portrays, uh, John portrays, for example, in chapter 17 and 18, he pictures the imperial Rome as a, as a prostitute who's drunk with the blood of, of, of martyrs. And so it's a revolting, disgusting image. Do you see what I'm trying to say? So the reason why I'm saying this is if this person who it was interpreting the book of Revelation, if they think that it's only about the distant future, then what would the what message would the book have had for John's own listeners? And the answer would be absolutely none. You see what I'm trying to say? So if you if you interpret, let's say, Revelation 13, 
and you interpret that of the Antichrist, well, that's 2,000 years in the future. It means that nobody, nobody in the first 2,000 years would get any benefit from chapter 13 of Revelation. But if it's, a, if it's like a cartoon showing that the uh, imperial power that is operating at the moment is actually satanically inspired and is, 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 is based on violence and killing people, then it has a message for every Christian down through the ages. Do you see what I'm trying? Do you, do you see what I'm saying? So obviously, I can't give an answer. Uh, obviously, it would take uh, it would take a long time to go through each part of the Book of Revelation and and give you an answer. But uh, it, it, I hope this kind of gives you a little bit of a perspective. The, the person who who the person who uh, took this view does not understand the genre. The, the genre, what the, the genre of, of the book of Revelation, and, and that the fact that John is drawing cartoons to shape people's perspectives about being loyal to Jesus during the during uh, in the midst of a of, of uh, an imperial power that causes us to be apathetic and compromise our values. Does that make any sense to you? Yeah, thank you very much. That clarifies it. Österreich. Yeah. <laughs> Wonderful. Well, thank you so much for that question, Chris. And thank you so much for the thorough answer, Dr. Gentry. Um, we have more questions, so we're just going to keep on rolling. Uh, David Blackwell submitted a question. So, David, if you would like to unmute and ask your question, you may do so now. Yeah, thank you. Um, let me see if I have it. Um, so, Dr. Gentry, as a uh, Hebrew Bible and Septuagint scholar, um, could you speak to the use of the prophets by the authors in the New Testament and how you'd like to see New Testament scholars handle those sort of quotations and allusions? And I guess I'm really thinking about like how, um, how the biblical authors use uh, pay attention to the context or perhaps don't pay attention to the context and then how scholars refer to the text um, of like the Septuagint or some other Greek text. Yeah, these are, are, uh, these are, these are big questions and big fat books have been written on them. Uh, well, uh, I, I, I wrote an article that was published in the, the Southern Journal the, the Journal of the Southern Baptist Theological Seminary. I wrote one on, uh, pros, what, uh, it's a big word, prosopological exegesis and the Psalms uh, to show that um, the, authors, the authors of the New Testament uh, are not just concerned about individual statements, they're concerned about the storyline the storyline of the whole Bible, uh, and they're putting that storyline together. Do you see what I'm trying to say? So, for example, uh, let's talk. Let's talk for a moment about the Book of Psalms. Well, we know that uh, from we know from the super from this from the superscriptions or from the Psalm titles that many of the Psalms were written by David. But um, the book of Psalms, the book of Psalms is actually an edited book. It's a hymnal, and uh, it it was it was probably put together in the, very late in the fifth or fourth century B, uh, BC. And so, even there. There, there's the perspective of David who wrote a particular psalm, but there's this, there's, there's the perspective of the editor who put that, who put those psalms together. Why did he put one psalm next to another? Because he wants you to develop a certain train of thought as you're reading these things together. Do you see what I'm trying to say? And so, 
you have to read the book of Psalms along with the prophets, which is what we're talking about here. So, for example, if we talk about the book of Isaiah, when you read the book of Isaiah, uh, it, God is going to bring God is going to bring deliverance and salvation. But we see two ideas. One idea is that God, there's a coming king. There's a coming king who who will bring deliverance and salvation. And this is not bad King Ahaz. It's not even good King Hezekiah. It's it's uh, there are there are three three sections in, in in chapters five to twelve that describe the king. He's the uh, he's the he's Emmanuel, uh, the uh, born from a virgin. He's the mighty God. He's a, a son that is born who can be called the mighty God, and he's the root, he's the, the shoot from the stump of Jesse. So there's a coming king, and we see that this king is connected with the line of David. So far, so good. But then when you read the rest of the book of I, uh, this same king is developed in the servant songs in chapters 49, 50, and 53. So there's the, those are passages that are dealing with the coming king. You also see it in chapter 61. But there are many other parts of Isaiah that says, that tell us Yahweh is king. Yahweh is the one who will rule over his people. So how do we bring those two things together? Well, it, 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 there, are, there are passages like Psalm 45, where the, king, where the king is addressed as God. Therefore, God, your God, uh, has exalted you above your fellows, you see. So we see how, 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 how are these ideas going to come together, that there's a human Davidic king and that Yahweh will be king. Well, it's not clearly revealed until we come to the New Testament and we see the revelation in Jesus Christ. So what the, what the authors are doing, of the New Testament are, are doing is, they're, they're not just interpreting... Indivi they're not just quoting individual texts. They're putting the storyline together. You see this in Hebrews chapter 1 when you, if you put, if you look at those quotations, bang, 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 you see that you have to see what quotation is put next to what quotation to see how he's putting the storyline together. Uh, here's, an, here's another example. In the book of Isaiah, in the book of Isaiah, he used uh, the word pair chesed and emeth, which means loyalty and faithfulness, faithful, loyal love. It's a way of summarizing our relationship in the covenant relationship between God and his people. And what happens in Hebrew poetry is that one word is put in the A line and another word is put in the B line. So this word pair which is a this word pair is summarizing the covenant in a single sound bite if you want to put it that way it's being so the word lo loyalty is put in one line and the word um, faithfulness is put in the a in the b line and i discussed this in the book for example uh, uh page 23 isaiah 16 verse 5 in love, a throne will be established. In faithfulness, a man will sit on it. So you see love in the A line and faithfulness in the B line. Then the next line says, one from the house of David. Then the fourth line says, one who in judging seeks justice. And the, the fifth line says, speeds the cause of righteousness. So here we have justice and righteousness spread over two lines which is another way of saying social justice defined not the way we define it in America today, but defined by the covenant, the covenant stipulations. And in the middle, you have one from the house of David. So someone, someone from David's line is going to faithfully implement the covenant. Now, when you look at, uh, let's, if we switch over to the book of uh, Ephesians, and I discussed this, in the first edition of Kingdom Through Covenant, in the chapter on Ephesians, at the end of Ephesians, Paul is talking about the armor of God. He's talking about our relationship with our enemy, and he's also summarizing 
He's also summarizing his message at the same time. And his me- if we wanted to summarize his message, we could say that the covenant is, is being truthful in love, speaking the truth in love. That's the covenant right there, chesed and emeth. If you look at what Paul does, he has two quotes from the book of Isaiah. And I, I forgot to mention it. Uh, I, uh, the word pair, chesed and emeth, occurs about 16 times in the book of Isaiah, always, always at a critical juncture in the literary structure. In, in Ephesians 6, Paul has two quotes from Isaiah that capture four out of those 16 word pairs. So obviously, Paul isn't just quoting one individual text. He's bringing you the whole book of Isaiah, and he's saying God is going to bring his people back into this relationship of faithful, loyal love. So uh, sometimes... Uh, some, uh, some, uh, uh, the question of the Septuagint is a difficult question, but I think the bottom line is two or three hundred years before the coming of Christ, the Jewish people translated the Hebrew and Aramaic Bible into Greek, and this, this, God, God, God this, this translation was greatly used by the apostles to communicate, uh, to, to, to communicate, uh, to communicate the message of the Old Testament, and where they quote it, uh, it's faithfully communicating that message. Um, and there are many difficulties in trying to understand what's going on and what's some, why it's different sometimes from the Hebrew, but the bottom line is it's communicating the message faithfully when they quote it. I don't know if that helps at all. Very helpful. Thank you. Perfect. Well, thank you so much for that question, David. And uh, thank you again, Dr. Gentry. We're going to keep on rolling. Uh, we, we've got some questions still coming in. Um, I'm not sure if Ambrose is on the call. I haven't uh, seen him, but he submitted a question that I'll just go ahead and ask for him. And then when he gets this recording, he can go back and listen. Um, so his question is, why is it that many preachers today interpret the message of the Bible out of context using their own words instead of the original meaning of the word, capital W, and many accept them? And then secondly, what shall we do to avoid this? Well, I guess the short answer is come to Phoenix Seminary, uh, where we uh, teach you how to read the Bible in Greek and uh, in Hebrew and Aramaic and how to... Uh, hopefully how to take things in context. Uh, so uh, we need more, we need more ministers and pastors and teachers who are, it, who are, who are trained. And t- let's be honest, it's a lot of hard work. A lot of, it's a lot of hard work to, uh, s- to sweat. It's a lot of hard toil and sweat to, uh, to, to do this work. And, um, many many preachers are better communicators than they are students of scripture so uh they uh communicate in very clever and fancy ways but the 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 real question is is the content that they're giving true to scripture and in many cases unfortunately it isn't that's helpful um and also just really applicable to anyone in any sort of ministry. Um, it's always just a good good reminder to be founded in scripture and to learn how to read your Bible well. Um, so thank you for that. Alberto, you submitted a question in the chat. So if you would like to unmute yourself and ask that question, you may do so now. Yes. Uh, so the question had to do with uh, the use of uh, the, the placement of the prophetic books in the Hebrew canon. Um, how important it is to understand its placement um, and how can we use that to teach others? This, this is my little one here. All right. <laughs> Sorry about that. <laughs> uh, so basically, the, the use of the original placement in the Hebrew canon. Well, there are different opinions on this. Um, I believe that the uh, old that uh, 
that there's a there's a statement in the Babylonian Talmud, Bababathra 14b, and I think it gives us the oldest arrangement. And the old the oldest uh, there are the oldest arrangement of the books of the Old Testament is in three parts: the law, the prophets, and the writings. Uh, the law is the Pentateuch as we know it. The prophets has two parts. The former prophets are Joshua, Judges, Samuel, Kings, and the latter prophets are Jeremiah, Ezekiel, Isaiah, and the Twelve. So that order is different from the order in our Hebrew Bible. In the Hebrew, in the original order, the history books were uh, were arranged chronologically, and the other books were arranged in order of size. So that Jeremiah is actually the longest of the prophets. Ezekiel is next, and Isaiah is actually the shortest book uh, of the three major prophets. So you don't measure if you if you have to read it, uh, Ambrose. Uh, is, is it Ambrose? Albert, I'm sorry, I forgot your Alberto. name. Alberto. 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 Uh, if you have to read it in Hebrew, it's not how many chapters, it's how many words there are. And so, um, and then uh, the third section is the writings. And the, the and there are two kinds of books. Now, the non-history books come first. Psalms, Job, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, Song, um, uh, Lamentations and Esther, and then they have, uh, sorry, and the Lamentations, then they have the history books, Daniel, Esther, Ezra, Nehemiah, and Chronicles. So, um, so, uh, so once again, the history books are arranged chronologically, and the other books are arranged in order of size. I think, uh, I think uh, the arrangement can be important because it uh, there, the arrangement, uh, if we look at the, the arrangement of the books in the New Testament, we, we, the, we, there are many things that we're not told, but we draw conclusions from the way the books are arranged. Uh, we draw conclusions about who, pe who certain authors were and, and what was going on by the way there. And so I think the arrangement, the arrangement can tell us something about uh, the theological understanding of the of the people who put the put the Bible in its final form. I don't know if that answers your question. Great. Well, thank you for that question. Um, and Dr. Gentry, we're going to keep it rolling. We have a few more questions that have come in the chat. Um, we have Philip. If you want to unmute and ask your question to Dr. Gentry, you may do so now. Yeah, uh, I had asked, do you view the prophets from a covenantal or a dispensational point of view? And is that too simplistic uh, a distinction? Yes, well, we wrote a 900-page book to answer this question. It's called Kingdom Through Covenant. And uh, so um, I think that... Uh, Classical covenant theology, both classical covenant theology and, and dispensational theology, do not put the storyline together as, as well as it could be put together. And, and we, we try to put it together in, uh, we try to put it together in, in this book. There's also a 275 page abridgment called God's Kingdom Through God's Covenants, uh, which, by the way, is now translated into Spanish and Portuguese and Korean. So, but um, it's important. Not uh, I would say that um, uh, the covenants in the plural are the key to the plot structure. So the Bible, we ha we need to read the Bible as a single book, not as a not as a collection of books. We need to read it as a single book from a single divine mind. And assume that it has a single plot structure, and um, and uh, the, we would argue that in order to do that, you have to understand the the major covenants in the Bible: creation, Noah, Abraham, Israel, David, and New Covenant. And you also have, in order to put them together, 
There are passages in the Bible that describe how these covenants relate to each other. So we not only want to understand those covenants accurately, but we, un- we want to put them into relationship to each other in the way that the Bible does. And when we do that, we'll get the storyline right. So neither I'm neither classical covenant theology nor dispensationalist. Okay, thank you. And by the way... The elephant uh, is a cartoon that represents Republicans, and the donkey uh, represents Democrats. Thank you. Uh, I, uh, I, uh, I'm not very familiar with uh, all of the American politics, so I need to be corrected on these things, but I was trying to communicate with the audience. All righty. Well, thank you so much for that, Philip. Uh, Dan, you submitted a question, so if you want to unmute yourself, you can ask your question now. Yes, uh, thank you, Dr. Gentry. Appreciate your talk. My question was regarding the continuity and discontinuity between the Old Covenant and the New Covenant. Yes. And I was hopeful that you might be able to shed some light, uh, particularly in the reading of the prophets, we apply it to ourselves. What does it apply to Israel? What applies to the church? Or is that uh, not a good question? Well, it is a great question. and, and, uh, And we deal with that in the book Kingdom Through Covenant. So that I deal with that in great depth in, uh, well, there's the 900 page uh, big edition and there's the 275 page abridgment. Um, I th- we see continuity and discontinuity. So uh, the way I would summarize it is um, a covenant is like a, pa- is like a package. It's a package deal where God God is is communicating who he is and he's communicating his righteousness and what it means to be in a relationship with him to a specific group of people at a specific time. And uh, as Christians, our, our relationship to God is not defined by the old covenant. Uh, that, that the righteousness of God that was enshrined in the old covenant has not changed. God's righteousness has not changed, but the way, but the package deal has changed. The same righteousness has been brought forward and, uh, commu- and, and offered in the new covenant. And so my relationship with God is defined by the parameters of the new covenant not by the parameters of the old covenant, but that doesn't mean that uh, somehow the righteousness of God has changed or, uh, or his character has changed uh, and what it means to be in right relationship to him. I so that's the simple short answer, I guess. Does that help at all? Uh, yeah, yes, it does. It, it just, when you're preaching through uh, the prophets, looking at the, for instance, Israel betrayed the, the covenant. Yes. Do we betray the covenant in the same way, or does Christ's fulfillment of the law and fulfilling the covenant on our behalf change that relationship because our relationship with God is, is now based upon Christ's righteousness and not our own? Yes. Well, everything... Co- uh, some people have accused me of replacement theology. Uh, I don't think the church replaces Israel. I think Christ... That Christ is, everything finds its fulfillment in Christ. So everything comes down, everything comes down to a point in Jesus Christ. And then, and then all who are related to God through Jesus Christ, it branches out from there to anyone. There are differences. Let me give an an example. Uh, How do you become a a member of the covenant community in the old covenant? Well, all you have to do is be born. You, you have to be born, and and for example, your circum if you're a male, you're circumcised. So that has nothing to do with your faith. And so, as Jeremiah says in Jeremiah 31, no longer will a, a a man teach his brother or his neighbor to know the Lord, because they will all know the Lord. Well, in the old covenant, everyone. How do you become a covenant member? You're born into the covenant community. And so that means as people grow up, some are believers and some are not believers. 
And the people who are believers are urging the unbelievers to know the Lord. But in the new covenant, only believer, all members are believers and only believers are members. So that's one area of discontinuity. Perfect. Thank you so much. Thank you. Big question. Great. Well, that's super helpful, Dr. Gentry, and great questions, Dan. Um, we're going to keep it rolling. We have three more questions. Uh, we're going to try to get through them in the next 10 minutes. So we have a few more minutes at the end for Cody to talk about the giveaway that he mentioned in the chat. So we're going to fly by these super quick. Um, I'm going to ask John's question because he's not able to use his microphone. He said uh, he would love to hear you, Dr. Gentry, share how to best preach through the major and minor prophets of the Old Testament? Well, that's a big question. I guess there are a number of different ways that you could do it. Um, uh, I think, I think, I think, first of all, we have to know how to read and understand these texts, and that's why I wrote the little book. And once we, once we uh, know how to read and understand them, then we can, we can figure out how to preach them. Uh, uh, for example, there's a lot of material in the prophets about social justice, not, not social justice defined by the way Americans define them, find, defined it today, you know, in terms of tolerance or just a minute. Uh, uh, tolerance or equity or majority rule or cultural approval or diversity, but but uh, social justice is really a summary of the stipulations in the covenant and what God requires of us and what 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 uh, what we can expect of Him. So uh, this is the true meaning of social justice. So, for example, there are many passages that would be very relevant to what's going on uh, in the world today. Uh, I, I think, I think uh, once we understand how how the the plan of God to bring a deliverer into the world and how that relates to the first coming of Christ and the second coming of Christ would be extremely helpful in uh, explaining the whole plan of God. Uh, Paul talks about the whole plan of God in, in, uh, in Acts chapter 20 when he spoke to the Ephesian elders. He speaks about the whole plan of God in Ephesians chapter 1. And so uh, I think uh, trying to understand the prophets is part of understanding the whole plan of God. So I think, uh, and, and even if we're not bound even if our relationship to God is not determined by the Mosaic Covenant, we still understand the character of God and the righteousness of God and, uh, and uh, who, who he is and how he operates through, through what has been revealed in the Old Testament. That's great. Um, John, I hope that was helpful. If you have a follow-up question on that, you can throw it in the chat and we can try to get it to Dr. Gentry so he can follow up. Um, Michael, you had a question. So if you would like to unmute and ask that, you may do. Hey, Dr. Gentry. Um, so I, I, I'd like to add on my question, um, looking at the post-exilic prophets, how does Haggai and Malachi expand like the expectation of God's future reign? I know Zechariah gets a lot of attention, but I feel like the other two um, are kind of left out. Feel free to refer me to your book, Kingdom Through Covenant. Uh, well, well, I don't deal. <laughs> I don't deal with much with Haggai and Malachi, but uh, you can see how Jesus and the apostles, uh, 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 the new, the authors of the New Testament, quote Haggai, uh, where it talks about uh, God is going to shake everything. God is going to shake everything, and uh, that the things that cannot be shaken will remain. So there's, I think that's in the book of Hebrews, isn't it? And then Jesus, you know, uh, um, 
Malachi talks about the coming of Elijah before the great and terrible day of the Lord, and Jesus shows how that was fulfilled in the ministry of John the Baptist, at least partially fulfilled in the ministry of John the Baptist. So, so there are uh, definitely, uh, uh, if, if we didn't have those two little books, we would be cut short, wouldn't we? Yeah. So I, I think uh, if you have a Greek New Testament, you can, you can uh, look at the index in the back and see who quotes Haggai and Malachi and see what they do with it. That would be a good place to start. Yep. Thanks, Dr. Gentry. All right. Last question. We did it, guys. Um, Gilbert, if you are still on the call, you are welcome to unmute yourself and ask your question. Um, and then if you have technical issues or you want me to ask it, just let me know. Oh, okay. Thank, thank you so much, uh, uh, Dr. Gentry. Well, uh, in Africa, we have a challenge here because every Sunday service, we must get a prophecy. So I don't know whether it is biblical because uh, in the Old Testament, I realized that the prophecies were given at specific times when there was a need for something to be accomplished. But in the current ledges of time, I, I look at things, how they happen. It's like prophecies are coming like a stream of water. So perhaps maybe you can expound on that, uh, uh, Professor. Well, you've made a good point. Um, uh, there's a good article on the word oracle in the Anchor Bible Dictionary, and it shows that the word oracle is a, is a message from a prophet that was often given to address a particular circumstance or situation. Uh, so uh, many of them were, act, you know, like Habakkuk, they're, they're addressing particular circumstances and particular situations and trying to explain how previous prophecies might might relate to this particular situation but uh it's important for christians to know to know these texts so we have to read them we have to read them systematically and uh, we have to read them regularly and systematically and make sure that uh, people know the contents of these books and then eventually in our preaching we have to help them understand the whole plan of God that is indicated in the prophets and what uh, one of the things one of the things I explain in the in the book is that uh, the the prophets did not distinguish between the first coming of Christ and the second coming of Christ. Uh, so you can see that it, when Jesus quotes from Isaiah 61 in Luke chapter 4, he stops right in the middle of the verse to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. He does not read the next part and the day of judgment of our God. So if, if we look at uh, the, the, the first coming of Christ is like a mountain, and then there's a valley in between, and then we have the second coming of Christ. If you're looking at it from this direction, you can only see one mountain. So the, the prophets put everything together in one panoramic vision, and they don't distinguish the first coming from the second coming. But, but uh, with the apostle, with Jesus and the apostles, we have the ability to distinguish between what applies, what applies to the first coming and what applies to the second coming. And we can help people uh, get a better understanding of the plan of God. I don't know if that helps you. Yeah, yeah, well answered. But um, I, I, can, I, can, I, can I just proceed another question? If you allow sure. me just one second. Well, uh, are prophets allowed to uh, operate a ministry? Because we have so many prophetic ministries, apostolic ministries, in, in Kenya especially. Well, I don't, I don't know if I, I don't, uh, I think people, uh, um, people who claim to be prophets today, well, they, they might have a, they might have a, a, a word, a specific word from God for a specific situation, but it's not scripture. It's not the same thing as scripture. Oh, sure. Thank you. Wonderful. Well, Dr. Gentry, we're so grateful for your time, and we're grateful for all of your thoughtful answers to these questions. 
Um, I'm going to go ahead and hand it on over to Cody Gibson, who is going to talk a little bit about um, the admissions process, if you haven't already connected with us and gone through it. And then he's also going to do the book giveaway. So Cody, it's all you. Awesome. Well, it's been a joy to be with you all. Thank you again uh, for being with us, Dr. Gentry. Thank you again for your time. Um, if any of you are interested in learning more about Phoenix Seminary, um, coming to study here on campus with Dr. Gentry, our team would be happy to help you with that. Um, the application process is, is quite simple and clear. All you need to do is go to ps.edu slash apply, and you can learn more about applying. There's an application form, a spiritual autobiography, uh, two recommendation requirements, and uh, transcripts that you must submit. Um, we'll also give you a, an app fee waiver code. Um, and I'm putting that in the chat right now, PS2022, and that'll waive your $40 application fee. Um, just really quick, some resources that you might want to know about related to Phoenix Seminary. Uh, Dr. Gentry mentioned the Text and Canon Institute. Um, the Text and Canon Institute, it's textandcanon.org. I shared that in the chat earlier. A great resource for um, articles on how we got the Bible. Um, so, you know, articles like, why are the, why is the Catholic Bible different from the Protestant Bible? Or, or why, uh, how do we, you know, how do we uh, interact with those who think we should only read the King James Version only? So anything related to text, textual issues, to canonization, uh, to translation, uh, there's great articles there. And then um, one other resource I just put in the chat a second ago, um, we made all of our online classes for our Old Testament 2 online class with Michael Thigpen available for free. So if you just click that link, you can access all of the course lectures for that class. You, you don't get credit for the class. You have to apply and, and actually become enrolled to do that. But if you want to see what the lectures are like and engage some of this content that we've been discussing today, um, uh, you, can, you can do that. Haley, is there anything else that I've missed that I might want to share before we give the book away and close things out? All right. Everybody, we're, we're great. We're good to go. Uh, thank you all so much for joining us. Thank you again, Dr. Gentry. We're so, so, so grateful for your time and your wisdom on this. And uh, I hope this was an encouragement to you all. Have a wonderful rest of your day.